Welcome everyone to Interfaceware's part two of our Did You Know webinar series, Interfaceware Development, Solutions and Workflows. This topic is something many of you have requested additional information on, and we hope today's anticipated webinar is informative and will help you maximize your interface development with Iguana. Some of today's highlights include modules and templates, EMR integrations, non-clinical applications, cloud service integrations, and much more. My name is Prashant Sri, and I'm the product marketing lead here at Interfaceware. In today's session, joining us, we have two Interfaceware staff members, Natalie, a sales engineer, and Avner from our customer solutions team, answering all of your questions live throughout this webinar. So at any time, we encourage everyone to ask a question using the Q&A box located within your Zoom window. No question is a bad question and we'll do our very best to answer your inquiry in real time. The questions can be about today's presentation or about anything Iguana related that you may have. Our presenter today will also be doing a few anonymous polls throughout this presentation. So feel free to participate and provide your feedback. As we normally do, we'll be sending out a post-event recap email Monday morning. So look out for that in your inboxes. With this video recording and additional resources specific to today's presentation to help you develop your skills in Iguana. It is now my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, my colleague and our speaker today, Leanne So. She is one of our experienced solutions architects here at Interfaceware since 2019. She is an expert in all things Iguana and has worked with a variety of our clients ensuring Iguana is used in the best way possible to solve interoperability challenges for all our clients. She has a degree in biomedical engineering from Ryerson University here in Toronto. And a few cool things about Leanne is that she has recently gone into cooking and baking with a focus on savory baked cookies for teas. It is now my pleasure to welcome my colleague and presenter today, Leanne. Thank you, Prashant. So welcome again, everyone, to our webinar today. Uh, so I guess without further ado, let's just get into it. So as Prashant has mentioned, we'll be covering the modules and templates, mainly why we use them and how we use them. And then we'll look at how those can actually help us with developing integrations in the EM EMR realm in with non-clinical applications and with those cloud services. So before we start, let's take a look at modules and templates in general. Why do we need them? How can we use them? What benefits do they provide? So why pre-built templates? Well, from our 20 plus years of working with clients and developing numerous healthcare integrations, we've seen the importance of being able to rapidly build integrations while ensuring they are easy to build and reliable in performance. This is especially the case when projects require building multiple complex interfaces at once, yet have very tight deadlines. One of the biggest examples of this that we've seen is when one of our clients had to migrate hundreds of interfaces from another integration engine to Iguana. As a result, we've identified pre-built templates and modules as a key method to enable you to systematically build repeatable and reliable interfaces. They do so by handling the foundation of the integration and allowing you to focus on calibrating the details of the integration. Did you know there are also many ways you can use our pre-built templates? Whether it's a template Iguana instance that you use to quickly deploy multiple instances, a template channel that you use to build multiple interfaces, or simply a pre-built module that you use to uh, across your interfaces, our pre-built templates and modules can help you accelerate your integration development and reduce your time to market. Now, in terms of the benefits, there are three main ones that I would like to highlight. We've made them easy to remember, three S's. The benefits are standardized integration, improved scalability, and streamlined system integration. Today, we'll cover several examples of our pre-built templates and modules, walk you through how to build your own templates and modules, and hopefully expand your horizons in what Iguana can do for you. As we do so, we'll see how these benefits play out. So keep these in the back of your mind as we go forward. So let's take a break here and just run our first poll. As a reminder, these are completely anonymous. 
my first question is, how many of you present are currently using Iguana's pre-built templates? Okay, so we're starting to see some results come in. So, so far, seems like the majority of you aren't using any templates. So it looks like this webinar will be very helpful, hopefully. Okay, I think we've, we're starting to get the majority of these in. Give you uh, 10 more seconds if there's anyone who wants to sneak in an answer. Okay, uh, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so as we can see, the majority of us, around 61%, are not using any templates. About a quarter of you are using some of our uh, interface word pre-built ones, and some of you are using your own, uh, which is good to know. So hopefully the majority of this webinar uh, will be pretty helpful in understanding how you can use some of ours and how to build your own uh, for those of you who are already using some of ours. Now into our first category of integrations, EMR integrations. HL7 interfaces with EMRs are some of the most common ones that we see, making them particularly suitable for using template channels. This is especially the case for large hospitals, which can require hundreds of HL7 interfaces. Typically, it can take an average of 20 hours to develop a single HL7 interface. But with the help of our template VMDs and channels, this time can be cut down to four to eight hours making large scale interface development easier and faster without sacrificing reliability or maintainability. Did you know we have pre-built VMDs for many popular EMRs? You may be wondering, why do we even need a pre-built VMD? Although HL7 is a standard, every EMR has its own implementation of that standard and will typically provide you with an implementation guide to use during development. Often a large part of um, implementation time is spent combing through these guides for details, such as which segments and fields need to be included, what values you may need to remap or validate, and what implementation differences there may be between your upstream and downstream systems. Once you have a pre-built VMD, however, you have a VMD file that contains those details that can be reused for every interface with that EMR. To save you some time, over the years, we have built several of these pre-built VMDs for popular EMRs, such as Epic, Allscripts, Athena Health, and eClinical Works. If you have any questions about using these ones in particular, feel free to reach out to our support team. Now, besides our interface where pre-built VMDs, you can also build your own, and it's quite easy to do so. When you're doing so, we recommend that you keep the individual VMD files consistent in terms of the HL7 version, the EMR system, and the message type. This makes it much easier to organize and maintain your template VMD files. Now to actually build your own pre-built VMDs, again, it's very easy to do so. The first step is to get your EMR's implementation guide and identify the necessary message types. So in this example, we have an EPIC ADT implementation guide. Second, you'll need to import the HL7 standard version of the message types from our built-in library in Chameleon. This saves you a lot of time as it gives you the full message definition for the standard HL7 version of that message type. All you have to do from there is review the implementation guide and compare the segment and field specifications with the VMD. We would recommend removing anything that the IG does not implement in order to keep your VMD file light. So as you can see here in our example, with our Epic VMD, it is much simpler and more straightforward in terms of what it uses compared to the standard. Fourth, we would recommend building the catch-all message definition to catch any non-compliant messages. And finally, to maximize the benefit of this pre-built VMD, we recommend creating message definitions for all of the message types you are likely to implement. The more effort you put into developing this now, the less work you'll have down the road when you're on a tighter project deadline. For example, here's our EPIC ADT VMD. As you can see, it contains a quite a long list of event types and not just a few that we would expect to work with. Did you know 
We also have several pre-built EMR adapter channels. We'll look at three in detail today. Our code map util, HL7 mapping, and HL7 to database. The code map util channel is a useful utility channel that you can use to quickly generate code maps for your interfaces. Rather than being a template channel of its own, it serves as a supplementary tool to help accelerate the development process when using the other template channels. It is best used in situations where code maps are required for values that belong to a code set. It does so by providing functions for generating code map stub code for two scenarios. The first is for different code types for a given HL7 version. So for example, we can select uh, HL7 version 2.5 and request the administrative sex and segment action code code sets. This will give you the stub code for those code sets. You can then copy the stub code into your mapping code to quickly assemble the values needed for code set validation or mapping. We'll see what this might look like during the demo. If you're receiving abnormal values, for example, female instead of F, it becomes very straightforward to add the required cases since the permitted values are already provided. Now for the second scenario, this is for different code types across different versions of HL7. For example, you may be receiving version 2.5.1 messages and sending to a system that operates on version 2.3. In the administrative sex code set, two codes, A for ambiguous and N for not applicable, were added in version 2.5.1 that weren't present in 2.3. Here you can see that we've opted to map those values to the default code value of U. This function thus gives you the code to map between the two versions code sets, allowing you to save on the time and effort required to look up the differences and write out the code yourself. This is especially useful when you have multiple code types that need to be accounted for. So here we can see that the 2.5.1 specific codes of A and N are mapped to you for the outbound version 2.3 messages. Now for the second and third adapter channels, these are template channels for connecting with EMRs. Our first one is a HL7 to HL7 mapping template. And the second one is a HL7 to database mapping template. As you'll see shortly, since the template channels have been well abstracted and generalized, the two templates are actually quite similar. So here we are in my iguana, and we'll take a look at our HL7 mapping channel. So as you can see, the main.lua itself is quite concise, and it primarily focuses on the key concepts or the key steps that are common to every kind of HL7 interface. We have our parsing of the message, filtering the message if it's not supported, and building and mapping the outbound message. We also have the uh, pushing it to the downstream and some logging as well. Besides this high level workflow in the main.lua, we can also see that the message type is a variable that is used to select the particular mapping and filtering functions to apply to that message. In, co in combination, these two make this template very easy to reapply in multiple situations, because this means that you don't have to change the main.lua at all regardless of whether you're working with multiple or different types of messages. So in our case, we have an ADT, but if we were to use an ORM uh, or an ORU, the entire structure would still look the same at the high level. And the reasons for this is because we have separated our concerns or these key concepts or key steps into separate modules. So let's take a look at these modules themselves. So here we have configurations, filters, mappings, and utilities. Now these utility modules are the ones that handle the process of automatically detecting what the message type is and calling the appropriate filters and mapping modules. If you aren't planning on modifying these or changing them, then you can just ignore these whenever you're using our template channel. Now for the configurations, if we look over here, we can see that this sets which VMD files we'll use for our inbound and outbound messages. The reason for why we've selected both the inbound and the outbound as separate VMDs is to account for the cases where you are working with either multiple EMRs or HL7 messages from multiple uh, different versions. 
So this facilitates the ease of using this template for those different cases. In the code sets, this is the location where you would copy and paste that stub code uh, from our code map util channel. And as you can see, it's the same structure of our, uh, the code sets that we had um, earlier. Since this is a template channel, you can also include any common code sets that you expect to use across all of your interfaces. And that can save you some more time. So that's the configurations. Now for the filters, we have a main filter function that automatically calls all of the filter functions that are nested in this filters uh, Lua table. The benefit of this is that it means that you can add any default filters or filters that are common to all of your interfaces, as well as customize additional filters per interface. And they will all automatically be called. You don't need to add any logic to call the filters. All you have to do is add them into this table. Now for our mappings, one thing to note with this is that the name of the mapping module must match the name of your message type. This is because the utilities use that name to identify which mapping module to use. Another thing, another thing to note is that the structure of this mapping module is segment-based. So we have individual functions to build certain segments. The reason for this is that we have found that this is the best practice for you uh, to build out your mapping code, particularly in the cases where you are working with different versions of HL7 or slightly different uh, implementations of the message types. This is because it allows you to use our map tree and map range functions, which typically are restricted to messages that are fully identical or segments that are fully identical. In other words, you can easily use our segment-based structure in order to simplify the segments where you don't have to do much mapping and you can simply map them all across, or you can add in custom mappings uh, for those specific segments fields. Besides this, we can also see that the code set is being used in this mapping module. All we have to do is call that module, uh, put in the, the code set that we were working with, and pass in the value from our inbound message. This automatically returns the uh, code mapped version uh, of the outbound value. So in this case, we are getting uh, M straight to M. And finally, in the mapping module, we'll see at the bottom down here, uh, that we have a main build message function. This one handles building the structure of our outbound HL7 message, as well as calling the individual segment uh, build segment functions. The reason for this is that it makes it easier for you to easily call the necessary segment functions and remove any additional code from the template if it's unneeded. We recommend that when you're building out your template mapping module, uh, that you build out your mappings to the most complex case, as you've seen here. This is because it's much easier for you to cut unnecessary code compared to adding in new code, especially when you're on that tight deadline to build your interface. And so going back to our main, as you can see, the template has uh, of, the, of the main is quite high level. And all you have to do when you're reusing this template channel for a new interface is update your configurations, your filters, and your mappings. The high level workflow of connecting all of those together and um, calling them in the correct order is all handled by the template channel itself. Now, if we look at our HL7 database, it's quite similar in terms of the structure. The only thing different here is that we're inserting it into a database instead of uh, pushing it to a HL7 message that's pushed to the queue. The other main difference is that in the configurations, we have additional configuration modules specific to the database. So things like connecting to the database, in this case, it is a SQLite database, but you could use it with any other database, as well as functions that uh, generalize the database process. So things like inserting data or reading data, these are where you would locate those processes, especially if those are common processes across your uh, database uh, interface. We also have a SQL scripts module to allow you to easily organize your SQL queries or your scripts, and also include any default or common scripts that you expect to use. With filters, it's exactly the same as the HL7 to HL7, so nothing new here. And then for the mapping, the main difference is either you would map it to a staging table or simply pass the parameters to one of our uh, database processing functions. And so as you can see, 
from this template and the other template, the template channels themselves are well built. All you have to do to reapply them or use them to create a new interface is update the configurations, the filters, and the mappings. And so in terms of the benefits of the EMR adapters, as we've seen in the code, they play a big role in standardizing the structure of your HL7 integrations and consequently improving their scalability. This is seen through the impact of the utility functions in making the template channels easy to adapt to any type of HL7 message, as well as through the structure of the template, which only requires you to update the configs, the filters, and the mappings for any new interface. So now it's time for our second poll of the day. What do you think is the uh, biggest benefit of a pre-built EMR adapter? So the poll should now be open and you can take your guesses. And just another friendly reminder, we will actually be sending this recording and other resources associated with this presentation and a follow-up email on Monday. So please do look out for that. And if any of your colleagues have missed it, you could share that link with them as well. Okay, I think we have about half, oh, now 60% of the group in. Uh, the majority so far looks like it's the standardizing the integrations. And I think we'll give it another 10 seconds if anyone wants to add in their last answers. Okay, three, two, and one. So as you can see, it looks like the majority of you think standard integrations is the biggest benefit. And there's a, about a third who think scalability, uh, improved scalability is the better one. So I think it's definitely a harder question because the two are quite closely linked in this particular case. Um, but it's good to see that standardizing is uh, very attractive for a lot of you. All right, moving on to our next section. So in our next section, we'll talk about integrating with non-clinical applications. As healthcare has evolved and continues to evolve, increasing focus has turned towards the patient experience, particularly during COVID as much of it has moved online or over the phone. Consequently, many non-clinical applications are adapting themselves to apply their existing services towards improving the patient experience. With Iguana, Integrating your clinical workflows with these non-clinical applications is easy to do, particularly if you pre-build adapters to help streamline that process. One example is Salesforce's health cloud adaptation of their existing CRM product, which seeks to improve the patient-provider relationship and the management of patient information. One of our customers came to us for help with converting their HL7 messages to patient data in Salesforce. This was really easy to do given Iguana's ability to connect to any type of interface and the fact that we already had a pre-built Salesforce adapter. With that, the majority of the work of connecting with the API and identifying requisite uh, object parameters was already handled. So we could focus on building the main workflow of the interface and complete the interface much faster than usual. Given many of these non-clinical applications use APIs to integrate and communicate, pre-built API adapters can be extremely helpful in reducing the development effort required. For example, other adapters we've built over the years have targeted integrating with systems such as Twilio, which provides API accessible telecommunication services such as SMS and email messaging, which can be used with clinical workflows to provide automated patient notifications, and Athena Health, which provides cloud-based EHR services for communication with mobile applications and for data analytics. Based on, on our experience from building and working with these adapters, we'll walk you through several key steps to consider when building your own pre-built adapters for connecting with non-clinical integrations. First of all, when creating your own API adapter, we recommend having a module that generates a Lua object that contains all of the key details and functions that you need to access the API. For example, this is what the Salesforce adapter object looks like. 
Here we have a single line of code in the main.lua that initializes the connection object. Within the object itself, we can find functions for interacting with various objects in, the, in target application, as well as details for accessing the API. This makes the process of interacting with the adapter much simpler and easier when adding the adapter to the translator of a new interface. Now, the first step of building this object is to review the API documentation for the given system. Typically, if it's a well-developed API, there should be an endpoint that allows you to retrieve the metadata uh, from uh, regarding various resources or objects. Otherwise, they may simply provide the metadata in a JSON or XML file that you can download. Now, depending on the approach, we recommend building functions that will interact with that metadata to dynamically populate your, your adapter object with fields and functions based on the contents of the metadata. This results in minimal maintenance requirements when the API is updated, as the code will dynamically adjust based on the provided metadata. For example, Salesforce has an S object describe endpoint that returns the metadata for a specified object. In our, in our Salesforce adapter, we have functions that hit that endpoint for the specified object and dynamically creates fields and functions for it. Alternatively, as in the case of the Athena Health adapter, you may need to re manually retrieve the JSON file and store it in the translator. This file should then be parsed in the same way you would handle the metadata from an endpoint, such that at the end, you have a Lua object containing the key functions to construct your various resources or objects. Since Athena Health uses the open API structure for their JSON files, the maintenance effort is also minimal beyond updating the cached file. Now, it's also important to note that we highly recommend including helper functions when constructing your metadata generated functions. This allows you to create the helper details in the translator, as we can see here with the Salesforce adapter, where it describes the function, as you can see here, provides lists of possible parameters, and gives you detailed information about how the function operates. This makes developing new interfaces much easier as the key parameters are listed out for you. Iguana has several built-in functions showcased here to help you understand how to create your own helper functions. You can also refer to our existing adapters if you have any trouble with customizing your help info. Now in the second step, we also recommend including API connection details in your API adapter object. Common ones include the API endpoint and any authentication tokens or details that the API requires. Since most APIs implement some form of authentication, such as OAuth or basic authentication, uh, this is something that is very important as part of your overall API adapter workflow. First, we recommend creating a separate module to dedicated to handling any credentials that need to be used. For example, in Salesforce, we have details like the consumer key, the consumer secret, and your username and password. Here we've encrypted these credentials using the encrypt password utility module and simply loaded them into our Salesforce connection object from the encrypted file. Next, we create functions that handle the process of authenticating with the API. Uh, in this particular case, we'll highlight a few of the common steps using the example of Salesforce, which implements OAuth. In this adapter, we have individual functions to handle retrieving the token over HTTP or cache the token and retrieve the token from a local storage. Once these functions are created, the full workflow can be initiated via a main function in the adapter module that handles creating the adapter object with its functions and connection details. When, when handling the authentication process, there are also several pre-built modules which you may find helpful. First, the store module, which we use for caching tokens and expiry dates. Then the encrypted password module, which we saw um, and is useful for storing credentials. And finally, the crypto API, which contains several functions which may be helpful for signing, verifying, encrypting, and decrypting processes. Now for the final step of building the API adapter, this is the step of testing your code in the API sandbox or development environment, and also building in your error handling code, such as the use of retries or protected calls to handle the various issues that can occur. Here's the example from our Athena Health adapter, where we handle the different codes that are returned uh, from the web service. Another aspect to consider at this point is the performance of the code. Since building the metadata generated functions can be resource heavy, 
we recommend initializing them outside of the main function in the main .lua, like so, as you can see. This ensures the initial building of the connection object is only done once when the channel starts and it persists in memory for each polling of the translator thereafter. Another area of consideration is the size of the metadata that is either stored in the translator as a JSON file or being retrieved from the API. In the former case, we recommend keeping the JSON files small or caching them in a SQLite database. In the latter case, we recommend only retrieving the metadata for objects or resources, which will, which will be used in the integration to reduce the amount of overhead required. For example, in our Salesforce adapter, we have uh, a list of the Salesforce objects that will be implemented in the interface and only those particular objects. In conclusion, pre-built API adapters are particularly useful for streamlining your system integrations between clinical and non-clinical applications and improving the scalability of such any such integrations. They do so by significantly reducing the amount of development effort to set up the API connection and create API compliant resources. As modules, the adapters can easily be added to any new channel or integration, making scaling up of similar integrations much simpler and faster than before. Now for our final section of cloud services. Cloud services are becoming increasingly popular as nearly every hospital has some degree of a cloud footprint, whether it's used for storage, development, testing, or even hosting their entire IT infrastructure. As a result, it becomes very important to understand how to deploy Iguana in the cloud and use the available cloud services to expand your existing integrations and workflows. Some examples we'll cover today include moving data into the cloud, engaging with cloud-based authorization processes, and integrating with cloud clinical systems. Did you know cloud provisioning services can be used to accelerate the process of deploying Iguana on cloud servers? By itself, Iguana can be easily deployed on a cloud server in the same way as you would on a virtual machine. Now, before we go into the details of how that actually works, let's do a quick survey and see what everyone is using in terms of the cloud services. So uh, our poll, you should now be able to see our poll and let's see which ones are the most popular. Are people more using AWS? Do people like Microsoft or another provider or are you not using any cloud providers at all? So far, we have about 50% of you who've answered. And so far, AWS seems to be, AWS is a leader and no cloud is also another leader. We've got a few Microsoft people out there. Okay, uh, 10 more seconds and then I'll close the poll. Get your last answers in while you can. So also All right. the uh, so many questions coming in. So please uh, feel free to ask any questions Iguana related as well. So mm -hmm. uh, we've got two great people uh, on standby to answer anything. Yeah, for sure. All right, so it looks like AWS is the winner. Uh, Azure is a bit, uh, is a close, relatively close, but we've also got quite a few of you who aren't using any cloud providers at all. So maybe this uh, section might be helpful for seeing what you can do with the cloud services. So um, before I get into the details, one key advantage of moving to the cloud is actually that most cl cloud providers also provide a method for automatically deploying your infrastructure from code. So in AWS, you have CloudFormation, in Azure, you have ARM templates, regardless of which one it is, these services allow you to actually automatically deploy new servers with preset configurations and details. This includes the structure of the virtual machine as they have the option of deploying new VMs from existing images. One example of this is our Azure Fire POC, which uses an ARM template to deploy the VM and automatically install a preloaded iguana. When you first deploy your ARM template, for example, it typically requires several details such as the Azure subscription, resource group, and a few other settings. Uh, in this particular case, it does also require some details for connecting to the Fire server. But if you're deploying it for a different scenario, obviously those ones aren't required. From there, once you deploy the template, 
it proceeds to create and configure the infrastructure that is required, including the VM, networking configurations, resource groups, et cetera, based on the parameters provided and your selected VM image. This image is created from a separate VM that contains the pre-built POC iguana, or it could be even just a template iguana. So in this particular case, it's a VM that contains the directories for the iguana application files, our fire sample data, our log directory, and our working directory. The main idea is to include your application files and a working directory that contains the Iguana main repo from your template Iguana, as this is what allows you to install the Iguana with preloaded channels and configurations. And if you're not working on the cloud and you don't think you're going to be making that switch anytime soon, this is something you can still do uh, with, um, in terms of building your template Iguana. Once you have your VM image with the necessary files, you can configure the ARM template to run an auto installation PowerShell script that installs the Iguana instance with all of your template channels and configurations. After deployment of the template, you just need to remote into the VM and license the Iguana. And as you can see, the preloaded channels are immediately available and you can start the workflow right away. We'll revisit this POC in more detail later on. Now that we've discussed how you can quickly deploy Iguana on the cloud, Let's see what you can do with Iguana once you're actually on the cloud. Since cloud services are in the cloud, many of them are easily accessible via APIs or web requests. One major example is cloud storage. The advantages of cloud storage are often one of the major reasons for moving to the cloud in the first place, because cloud storage is typically more scalable, secure, and reliable than anything an average organization can create in-house. In AWS, they have a simple storage service, or S3 for short. And in Azure, there is a similar service known as the blob service. Both of these cases have REST APIs that you can use to easily transfer data from local files into the cloud. This is where Iguana can come in. As we've covered previously, we can easily create API adapters to connect clinical workflows to non-clinical ones, or in this case, storage applications. Since we've had several customers inquire about S3 in particular in the past, we've already created an S3 adapter, which you may find useful. But as you can see, since we've covered how to easily build your own API adapters, it's very easy to integrate your clinical workflows with any cloud service storage option that has an API endpoint. Beyond storage options, we can also integrate with cloud-based authorization services, services, such as Azure AD. Cloud-based authorization services, such as single sign-on, are highly requested particularly in the Azure environment, given the usefulness of the Azure Active Directory service for centralizing user management and improving the user login experience. In this case, Azure Enterprise offers an option for creating non-gallery applications, which can be interacted with via a web request. This allows us to enable external authentication through the Azure AD. Here we have two template channels which handle that interaction. When the user first accesses the Iguana, they'll access it via the URL to our SAML user channel. This channel then sends a web request containing the SAML request to the non-gallery application, which acts as an identity provider. This application provides a redirect URL, which the channel returns to the user. The user then is thus redirected to log in via their Microsoft account. And Azure then sends the authentication result to our SAML assertion channel, where Iguana validates the result and logs the user in with the appropriate user and role. Now, although the workflow of this particular interface is quite different from our API adapters, you can see how Iguana's ability to connect with web services can be applied to integrating with authorization-related cloud services too. And now finally, in the realm of cloud services, Iguana can also integrate with clinical cloud services. From Azure and AWS's foray into creating fire servers to Google's development of their healthcare API, we can see a growing trend in cloud-based healthcare services. So let's go back to our Azure Fire POC, as this is one example of how we can use Iguana to integrate with those cloud-based healthcare services. So let's take a, quick, a closer look at this POC together. All right, so in terms of this POC itself, it is 
uh, actually already documented on our help documentation. So if you want the details for how to deploy it or how to use it, these are all here. For today, we're only going to highlight the key pieces which are related to what we've been talking about today. So these are how to deploy Iguana via a cloud template, how to deploy a template Iguana, and how to use API adapters to connect with clinical cloud services. So over here in Azure, we have our ARM template. So if I take a look at this template, you can see there are several parameters uh, that correspond to the ones that I've had in my screenshot previously, showing the, thing, the things we have to add or um, provide to the template when we're deploying it. So some of these include how the credentials or the details for connecting to the fire server. Besides this, there are two key parts to this template. One is the VM image that I'd mentioned, uh, where you have an image from a VM where that entire iguana was already set up. In our case, with the fire, uh, the channels for facilitating our workflow, which is just a simple HL7 in file, converting that to a fire resource and then pushing it to the Azure Fire server. So that's one piece in terms of how the ARM template automatically uh, loads our pre our, uh, our template iguana. And then the other piece is one that we'll see here, which is a PowerShell script. Uh, and we have two variables here, iguana configure module URL and iguana configure function, which point us to a GitHub link that contains our PowerShell script. So over here, I have our GitHub repo. And if I just take a look at the PowerShell script, uh, let's take a look at the items that are specific that are, I guess, really important to this workflow. So for one thing, we have the same parameters for connecting to the Azure Fire AP, uh, server. And one thing this PowerShell script does is that it loads these into the Iguana environment variables. And obviously this can be applied to other environment variables if you have ones that are, are common across your uh, Iguana instances. The other thing this does is that the script declares our variables for our uh, Iguana directories. So things like the installation directory, the application directory, our working directory, uh, even our fire, uh, fire sample data folder, which we'll be using. And then finally, this also the script also handles the process of uh, installing our Iguana service and running the service. So what this means is that once the ARM template has completed deployment, when you remote into the VM, you should be able to simply uh, hit the local, the local host URL and see the Iguana up and running. You just need to license it and then your channels are ready to go. So now let me switch over to our Azure VM. So I already uh, set this up earlier today and licensed it just to save us a bit of time. But as you can see, our channels are ready to go. So we can just run a few messages from our file. And once they're processed, we should be able to see them in the Azure Fire Server dashboard. So those are through now. And if we refresh our dashboard, we can see all of the sample patients have been added. So now let me switch back to the Iguana. So that's the first two po uh, points addressed, the how to deploy Iguana via a cloud template and how to deploy a template Iguana, also via a cloud template in this particular scenario. Now, in terms of connecting to the clinical uh, cloud services, we're looking at, again, th the three tips that we talked about in terms of building your API adapters. The first one being uh, getting your metadata, generating functions from that. The second, then authorization. And finally, your error handling, uh, testing, and performance. So for our first step, that's actually located in this mapper channel. And you'll see here that we have a folder, a fire folder containing our specific modules for the fire adapter. In this particular case, we have our metadata stored and cached in a SQLite database uh, for two specific reasons. First of all, fire as a, as a standard, um, its versions are consistent and aren't likely to change unexpectedly and still be known as the same version. So caching a specific versions uh, metadata is fine and we don't need to update it regularly unless you're adding um, your own custom uh, resources or if you're changing the version of fire that you're working with. The other point is that with fire resources, these are particularly large 
uh, JSON files because there's so much uh, there's so much data that's involved in terms of the fields and uh, the structure of that resource. And so it helps us to, to store these in a database file because it can reduce the overhead uh, of the translator having to store all of those in the raw JSON files. And besides that, we have our standard modules for parsing that metadata and generating our uh, fire adapter functions. And so if we look over here in the main.lua, similar to how we saw with SF API for the Salesforce case, we have our profiles object, which has all of the functions that we need to create different resources. And it also has helper, uh, the helper functions that we've automatically built in this module. So that's the first tip or the first step from our uh, API adapters. Now for the last two, these are found in this separate channel. And the reason for that is actually because of performance um, to increase the performance of the overall workflow. We've separated out these concerns of building the resource and mapping to the resource and connecting it to the Azure Fire server. Uh, this is mainly to prevent any bottlenecks from occurring on um, due to having both of those concerns in a single translator component. And so that's one aspect in terms of the performance uh, of how we've structured this particular POC. Now, in terms of authorization and the error handling, we have that in this AD token API module. So here we have the uh, web service error function, which has our error handling based on HTTP codes. And further down, we also have functions to retrieve our access token uh, from the Azure AD. So with this particular example of the uh, Fire, Azure Fire POC, we get a token from the Azure AD and use that to authenticate uh, and access the F Azure Fire server. Besides that, you can see there are some retries and P calls scattered throughout this module. And so that fills out our second and third tips of building our API adapters. And so going back to our slides, to review in terms of the cloud services, we've seen how we can easily interact with various cloud services through our pre-built API and web service-based modules or template channels, allowing for streamlined system integration. We can also easily scale deployments of Iguana via ARM or CloudFormation templates and the use of template Iguana instances in the deployment of those templates. So in conclusion, through today's webinar, we've seen that Iguana's ability to pre-build templates and modules allows us to standardize our integrations, improve the overall scalability of Iguana and our interfaces, and streamline our system integration, whether it's in the realm of clinical data conversion, API integrations with non-clinical applications, or working with cloud services. If you have any questions about accessing or using any of the adapters mentioned in today's webinar, uh, please feel free to reach out to our support team and they'll be happy to help you out. So thank you again for joining us today for the second part of our Did You Know series. Uh, we hope to see you again at our remaining two webinars, Iguana Configuration and Administration and Interface Development. Thank you so much, Leanne. That was wonderful. Uh, this well-anticipated webinar, you've answered all the questions. So really thankful for that. Uh, there was a lot of uh, questions being asked in the Q&A, and I know our support reps are just answering all of them, and that's fantastic. And just to let you guys know as well, uh, next Monday, we will be sending out an email, a recap, a video recap of this entire presentation, any of the main questions that were asked, and any additional resources that would help support you with developing interfaces uh, with Iguana. Uh, we have two more in this series of the Did You Know Iguana series. Uh, so our next webinar will be happening in the last week of October, and we'll be uh, sending out emails regarding that in, in about a couple of weeks time. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, and in the meantime, if you do have any further questions, don't hesitate to contact us at contact at interfaceware.com, and we'll definitely answer any of your questions. So on behalf of Interfaceware, once again, thank you for joining us at this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.